welcome tonight uh, to this webinar series, which is part of the e-mental health in practice program, which is uh, a program funded by the federal government, which is aimed to increase health professional awareness of and familiarity with e-mental health resources and understand how those e-mental health resources can be utilized in your clinical work. Uh, this is hosted by the Black Dog Institute, uh, which is primarily a research institute into mood disorders and suicide prevention. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of this nation and acknowledge that this land was never ceded. I am currently on the land of uh, the Darug people um, and want to say that obviously it's a webinar, so we're all coming from different lands today. Uh, but I do want to recognise um, the continuing connection of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to land, water and community, and want to pay respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, elders past, present and emerging from all nations across this country and extend a special welcome to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us today. This is webinar 51 in our series on internet gaming disorder. By the end of this webinar, we hope that you're going to be able to describe the gaming behaviours that are related to high risk for disordered gaming, identify clients who are presenting at high risk for disordered gaming and how to refer those to specialised services, integrate game-related mechanics such as flow, presence and the user avatar bond in your case formulation and as you plan treatment for at-risk clients and also identify online resources that might be useful for families and people suffering from disordered gaming. So the focus really is on the background, the, the psychology and um, the, the assessment, but we will spend some time talking about treatment as well. We have a fantastic panel with us tonight. First up, we have Dr. Vasilios Stravopoulos, um, who's an academic and professional psychologist working in the area of disordered gaming. He's worked as the leading clinician in an outpatient program for problematic internet use at the Psychiatric Hospital of Attica in Greece between 2009 and 2012. He's done a lot of research in this area and Vass and Hillary are members of the DSM-5 Revision Task Force for the American Psychiatric Association in relation to internet gaming disorder. So thank you, Vass. We also have with us Dr. Hillary Cash, who's coming to us from Washington State in America. And I believe it's some awful time of the night there right now. Um, so I'm very grateful for, for you, um, to you for joining us. Um, Dr. Cash uh, is the co-founder and chief clinical officer of the Restart Clinical Center for Digital Technology Sustainably, Sustainability. It's actually the first long stay retreat program for adults in North America who are experiencing serious problems with their digital screen use. She's been working in this field for quite some time. Is that right, Hilary? Yes, since 1994. Wow, that, that is quite some time. And have you noticed some changes over, over that period? Um, clinically, the clients are looking mostly the same, yeah. but what is changing is the technology and uh, the, the increase in numbers of people who are getting caught up in it. I see, right. Mm, so interesting. So she'll, she's going to have a lot of clinical, a wealth of clinical experience to offer to us tonight. And my name is Phoebe holdenson Kimera. I'm a GP working in Sydney and I work with the Black Dog Institute on this particular project. Vasilios, can you um, start us off? What exactly is internet gaming disorder? So... First of all, thank you for, for inviting us and hosting this webinar tonight. Thank to all of you who, who spent the time to attend and thank you, Hilary, for helping us from the other side of the world. Um, so internet gaming disorder or gaming disorder or disordered gaming or gaming addiction, um, we will be using the term internet gaming disorder because this is the, the suggested term uh, by the, the American Psychiatric Association 2013, is a, is a form of addiction. And as a form of addiction, a behavioral addiction, um, needs to satisfy six criteria, six points. The first is what we call salience, which means once um, one has a specific frequency of engaging with games, 
uh, once per day, twice per day. Um, the next thing is mood modification. One is gaming to moderate the way they feel. They initially start to feel better and they progressively um, continue just to feel less worse. Then we have what we call tolerance, which means they gradually need higher doses of the behavior to achieve the same outcome. And this, to some extent, is related to the game mechanics. Um, we also have withdrawal symptoms. Uh, in, in the case of internet gaming disorder, these are mostly psychological, such as irritability and frustration when one is not in the game, not online. Uh, we also have conflicts and functional impairment. So the moment that the behavior establishes, um, Debates, disagreements emerge with significant others in the context of the person, parents, friends, peers, romantic engagements, if one has one. Um, and finally, what we call relapse, which is um, they wish to abstain, they wish to reduce their time gaming, but they often find themselves very difficult to achieve that. Mm. Um, and you may hear them saying, you know, I, I wanted to, but I you know, I couldn't. I just couldn't. It indicates a kind of inconsistency between the way they think, their decision-making processes, and the way they act. Mm, that so all, of these, all of these criteria, six criteria, salience, mood modification, tolerance, withdrawal symptoms, conflicts, and relapses um, in relation to gaming constitute internet gaming disorder. Mm. Now, how does internet gaming disorder fit within how we think about other sort of behavioural addictions? Thank you for posing this question, Phoebe. Um, so there's a continuum of social tolerance or acceptance of addictive behaviours. We have addictive behaviours which tend to be less socially tolerated, less socially accepted, uh, maybe because they are more interwoven with um, uh, offending or delinquency, uh, such as substance abuse. Uh, and these behaviours, because exactly they are less socially tolerated, tend to be less underdiagnosed. They are detected earlier and they are not missed out. Then somewhere in the middle, we have alcohol abuse. Alcohol is considered a kind of more socially tolerated uh, object of addiction. And on the other side of, of the spectrum, the continuum, we have behavioral addictions, which like gambling or gaming or the abuse of social media, which, um, which tend to be more socially acceptable forms mm. of behaviors. And therefore, they tend to be less, uh, less timely diagnosed, more underdiagnosed, and later diagnosed. Yeah, if that makes sense. And I'd like to add something, which is that um, these, these behavior, well, gaming in particular is started at a very early age. And bec because substance use and alcoholic abuse in children is, not, is known and recognized mm. to be a problem, it gets very quickly diagnosed once it's discovered, whereas gaming is uh, considered normal behavior and so in, in children, and so it is often goes very unrecognized. Mm, scary thought, isn't it? But of course it does have its harms, yeah. So what are the reasons um, or what are the functions uh, that, that exist when somebody um, uh, starts to suffer from internet gaming disorder? So we have three, three addictive functions, we call them in psychology. Uh, the first is lack of substantiate relationships. So one might be surrounded by others, but they don't um, have a substantiate connection with them to, to feel relief or to share the way they feel, or they could be completely lonely. The second is what we call lack of boundaries or control. And this is manifested in the way they, uh, they use their space, their rooms might be messy, their time, they might be awake at night, playing during the day, playing during the night, sleeping in the day, um, the way they use their money, they handle their money, spending. Um, and finally, the third addictive function has to do with lack of responsibility, accountability, and occasionally, occasionally manipulation. So the, the person often blames others for what's been happening in their lives. Mm. And it's the first step of treatment to introduce this sense of responsibility, responsibility and accountability. Mm. That saying, internet gaming disorder, when it comes to this third function, tends to, tends to be, um, those who suffer tend to, tend to present it less than in other forms of addiction. Yeah, sure. Now, 
what what are what do we see um, in terms of the behaviours uh, in somebody with internet gaming disorder? That's another very nice question, Phoebe, and I think Hillary might have a lot to say here too. We see three things again: a need of immediate immediate gratification. So I'm there. I, I want to immediately get satisfaction. I cannot wait. Impulse control issues. I cannot control control my impulse to involve, get involved with gaming and compulsive tendencies. I might, I might, I might get engaged with gaming to moderate an arousal. Mm. So lack of control, immediate need for immediate gratification and compulsive tendencies compose the, the broader picture there. Yeah. Hilary, what, what do you see um, in clinical practice in, in the patients? Well, it strikes me that these elements are probably elements that are you're going to find in all addictions. Mm -hmm. You know, there and I think all addiction, all addicts are wanting immediate gratification. And the quicker the gratification comes, uh, which it comes very quickly when it comes to the internet and and especially with gaming, then kind of the more um, the quicker the addiction takes hold. Mm. And, um, you know, and impulsivity and compulsion, I just think these are things that go along with all addictions, and we certainly see it with gaming disorder. Yeah, and I'm thinking that uh, when that prefrontal cortex is still developing uh, in, in an adolescent, they're already going to struggle with those, these features. Uh, of yes, and, and I believe there is uh, mounting research that shows that um, when children are engaged with gaming at an early age, it really impedes the development of the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So Vas, tell us, um, how do we, what, what's the diagnostic criteria for internet gaming disorder, given that there are so many people out there who, who are worried um, that their child or um, their spouse might have, might be addicted to games? What, how do we actually go about establishing <coughs> First, I would like to say that I, I see questions popping up in the chat, mm -hmm. and I understand that we don't have the time to, to address every single question. Please, please feel free to email us in case we don't make it now. Um, just one that I saw before, how do we differentiate compulsion from impulse control? Differential diagnosis issues con regarding addictions, impulse control behaviors, and compulsive behaviors um, have been consistent in the literature to the extent that some theoreticians, scholars have suggested that the three diagnostic categories, umbrellas, should actually be merged in one. And that's one of the reasons that, that um, internet gaming disorder has been often called impulsive gaming, compulsive gaming, uh, addictive gaming. Right. Okay. You know, it, it reflects on the definitions. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so tell us way, about the diagnostic criteria. I'm sorry, Phoebe, I understand we are pursued by the time. So we have two main pathways. One is APA 2013 DSM-5, where internet gaming disorder has been suggested to be a conditional diagnosis. So not a formal diagnosis, a conditional one based on nine criteria, which resemble a lot the six criteria of addictions that we defined earlier, plus uh, some extra uh, behaviors, preoccupation, silence, which we saw before, withdrawal symptoms, we saw that, tolerance, we saw that, tried to stop but has failed to do so, relapses, loss of interest in other life activities, impacting a person's life, functional impairment, lie to others, deception, manipulation. We saw it before in the addictive functions. One is gaming to escape the way they feel, mood modification, and they put at risk an opportunity and relations and, and, or, in a, or a relationship uh, due to gaming. So if one presents with five out of these nine criteria for over the period of a year, then it is suggested that they should receive this provisional diagnosis. When it comes to ICD-11, six years later, 2019, in the beta draft, uh, the criteria were significantly simplified. We have only three. Impaired control over gaming, the impulse control component, gaming takes precedence over other life interests, loss of interest, and continuation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences. And these, of course, need to, need to, need to occur for more than a year, mm. and independent of whether the game is online or offline, PV, person versus environment, I play by myself against the game, the game world, or PVP, person versus person, I play with multiple people in it. So the type of the game doesn't make a difference. Yeah. It's, it's the behaviors. Criteria. Yeah. 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 
Thank you. So let's think now about uh, our case scenario for tonight. His name is John. John's a 35-year-old man who works as a builder in a company that's owned by his cousin. He's married with two children and has no previous mental health history. He lives with his, with his family on the ground floor of the building owned by his wife's family. He doesn't have any siblings and he's generally a pretty quiet person. And he was never particularly studious, but he always had friends and he liked playing footy, you know, all throughout his adult life. He met his wife when he was 20 and they've been together since then, and they're, but they're currently attending couples therapy because things aren't going so well. The previous summer, he went and visited a friend from work with his family. Uh, and since then, he's been playing a game with that friend and a whole group of friends from work. And this game is called Tribal. He's never, he was never really interested in playing games before. Tribal's a strategy game where one's supposed to lead a country and have allies and enemies and opponents. There's also a forum where people can be informed about developments in the game, even when they're not playing. And his co-players are mostly from the same ethnic background. His wife comes to you with him just exhausted and fed up. He's playing for more than seven hours a day every weekday and more than 10 hours a day on the weekends every day, which means that he sleeps in every opportunity he has because he's just so tired. She says to you, he doesn't want to take part in anything anymore. It's like I've got a third child in the house. It's either the game or me. Now, uh, I guess something that really sticks out to me in this is that it's the wife who's brought him along or they've gone to couples therapy together, but it's really the wife who's driving a lot of this. Is that something that you see a lot in your work, Hilary? Um, yes. <clears throat> I think it's important for people to keep in mind that addicts live inside a bubble of denial. Mm -hmm. And until that bubble sort of crumbles, they are uh, not going to seek help on their own. And so it is usually a family member who is, you know, who takes the initiative, who recognizes there's a serious problem and is going to, you know, drag the person in to get help. So that's uh, very, com totally common in our own experience. Yeah, that's right. But that, that um, makes it difficult to engage them, isn't it? If they're not really that keen to be there. I don't know, Bas, what do you reckon? I think I would agree with Hillary, but I would also say that the fact that they are there mm -hmm. means that there is something inside them that agrees, even silently, with the fact that there is a problem. Yeah. Is it a healthy voice inside the, the client, the person, that we need to ally with and strengthen? Because they, mm -hmm. do, they do know deep inside them, if we get a little bit scratch the surface, they know that there is an issue. Yeah, right. That's, that's and really something I would like to add to that is I, I agree completely, um, but I also think that if it is possible to set it up such that the person actually um, is abstinent for a good long period of time from the gaming or from whatever the internet-based uh, uh, problem behavior is, that the brain will go through the changes of coming back to more normal function. And then it becomes so much easier for them to gain perspective on themselves and their behavior, how it's impacted uh, the world around them in their immediate environment. And, and they tend to be much easier. You know, they, they tend to see that there is a problem they have to work on. So that's ideal. Yeah. And probably their, their couple's counseling will go a bit be a bit more um, productive as well, I, I suspect. Mm -hmm. So, Hilary, when you when you listen to this story about John, what's what sticks out to you? Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is that um, it's unusual for him to be to develop a gaming addiction when he's thirty five years old, sure. because he's he's fallen off the cliff, as I say <laughs> about addiction. At that age, it means that he has many, many strengths to fall back on. He has a whole lifetime of good, healthy experiences of relationships and work and so forth. Um, and because of that, I think he'll be much easier to work with than someone who doesn't come with that background. 
right, as opposed to somebody who's been gaming excessively since they were a child or in their early ad- adolescence, they might be lacking right. those social skills and so on. Yeah. That, well, that that's really um, positive, isn't it? It's, it's good to know that yeah. um, John's probably going to have a good prognosis if, if he engages with this process. Um, Vass, is there anything else that sticks out to you um, in this story? I would just like to highlight one thing, that mm. the, the game one chooses usually very often, tends to compensate, substitute something that they are missing in their real lives. Yeah. Game Tribal is a strategy game where one needs to expand territory. And you mentioned earlier that this guy is living at the ground floor, at the ground floor of a three floors building with, um, with his wife's family. So I'm, I'm thinking of space and I will, I will try to explore that. And always the game itself that one becomes addicted to has a meaning. Keep yeah, thinking. right. So, so he he doesn't necessarily feel, um, you know, that he has control over his own physical space or the territory that he's living in. Well, maybe he's trying to seek that elsewhere. That's really, that's a very deep, um, deep, deep understanding. So, what is it that causes internet gaming disorder, Vass? Um, what goes in? We need to we need to seek the the sources of the problem in three main domains. Mm-hmm. The first is the person themselves who the person is and what they bring with them. The second is where the real surrounding of the person and how this surrounding could be pushing them to escape online. And the third is where virtually, what's happening in the game world, what type of mechanics are active there to engage the gamer. And I think we need to to explore all these sources concurrently. Mm, 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 mm. So that's really important in the history taking, isn't it? Um, So when we talk about who, you know, who's at risk, um, what sort of personality types are more at risk of developing disordered gaming? So based on the five big traits, personality theory, we have findings consistently longitudinal, cross-sectional, uh, and across different cultural populations and age groups of gamers that those who tend to be more conscientious, more responsible, more accountable, tend to be at lower risk for IDD, and the same is the case with other forms of addictions. And those who tend to be more open to experience tend to be um, at higher risk. And we also have some evidence for neurotis, neuroticism, which has to do with less emotional stability that increases the risk, and psychoticism the same. So personality-wise, just keep that in mind. Mm. Hilary, do you have anything to add here? Well, I think we'll, there will come a point where I'm going to want to talk about eye disorder. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't, is this the moment? Or no, go for <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So there is a book that I will want to recommend to everyone. Larry Rosen wrote it about 10 or 11 years ago. It's called I with a small I, I hyphen disorder. And he's proposing that there should be a new category of personality disorder. And it is, uh, it draws traits from several of the other personality disorders. They coalesce. Uh, again and again, and we have confirmed this by uh, giving for many years, we gave all of our incoming adults the MCMI, which is very good at at drawing out personality disorders. Mm -hmm. And the traits that we see coalescing again and again are avoidance, dependence, narcissism, and antisocial, and then a smattering of others as well, but those are the four that show up most consistently. And um, so if, and, and I do believe it is the result of a childhood lived in front of screens uh, and, and playing a lot of video games. Yeah, right. So that that personality disorder actually being developed by that, that person's experience. Yeah. So what's the, what, you know, there's already been a lot of discussion in the chat box about um, ASD and um, other, other mental health conditions and how that, that relates to internet gaming disorder. Vas, can you tell us a little bit about um, other psychopathology and its relationship to internet gaming disorder? So we have longitudinal evidence, which had empirical evidence and cross lacked panel designs, which suggest that um, internet gaming disorder tends to be what we call a secondary symptom, which flourishes on the ground of another primary symptom, another problem. It's the problematic solution of a pre-existing problem. Mm -hmm. But later on, 
this problematic solution becomes the exacerbator, the catalyst of the pre-existing problem. So one might be anxious, depressed, distressed, whatever. They escape through games. Their problems become bigger and the downward spiral comes. And I saw, I saw in the chat questions around autism, spectrum disorder, and ADHD. I think Hillary would address the ADHD part. But considering autism, yes, there has been evidence, once again, consistently um, in, uh, consistently suggesting that they are at higher risk. And the explanation, the hypothesis there is that cyber relationships, anonymity, accessibility, affordability, do not involve emotional and face-to-face -face, uh, contact skills required in, 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 in real life. And therefore, these people might might find themselves there, you know, more. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, isn't it? Hilary, can you tell us about um, what you see in terms of the um, the co coexisting mental health disorders? Yeah, the, there are four primary ones for the clients who come to restart. They are first and foremost depression and anxiety. Almost everyone who comes in is depressed, sometimes mildly, sometimes suicidally, um, but everyone is depressed. And very interestingly, uh, for most of them, after a month of being away from screens, you know, catching up on sleep, eating well, getting exercise, being social, um, they stop being depressed. Amazing. But they come in depressed. They come in anxious. They uh, the majority of them have a diagnosis of ADHD and uh, about a third of them come in. Well, they don't necessarily come in with the diagnosis, but they show traits that we associate with autism spectrum disorder. But I do want to just comment that I, we, our stance at restart, oh, which is born from experience, is to be skeptical about the diagnoses that they come in with. Mm. Um and to recognize that often what has occurred is that, first of all, uh, the diagnostician didn't find out about, didn't make the inquiry to understand that really what's going on often is first and foremost, the addiction. And that once the addiction clears up, these other things may also clear up. And if you think about ADHD being mostly a problem of attention and a short attention span, um, what if you think about a child who from a very early age and remember now kids, infants are being handed uh, screens and and invited to play infant games on screens, mm -hmm. you can really get a child's brain wired for short attention span. And so they're and and to be highly stimulated. So they may really look like they have ADHD. And I'm just always a little bit skeptical about yeah. that. Right. And the same with uh, autism spectrum disorder. If you put a young child too much in front of a screen, not enough attention and, and social interaction with uh, the family and, and other people, you may end up with a child who doesn't inter who's more attached to a screen than to people, doesn't pick up social cues and, uh, you know, looks like they yeah. have. So depriving oh. them those opportunities to actually yeah. develop those skills. Yeah. So... I mean, obviously, people game for a reason. They're getting some sort of meaning out of it. Um, Fast, can you tell us um, how that all, yeah, ha how people people do that? I guess, I guess your question Phoebe, ties very well with the other two sources of the problem that we mentioned before. What's happening in one's surrounding and what's happening within the game world? So all of us are seeking meaning in our lives. And... Empirical evidence in positive psychology suggests that we have four channels to achieve meaning, a happy life. One is a sense of belonging in a community, family, community, political kind of group, anything. Um, the second is a sense of purpose, a life direction. We are heading towards something. The third is challenge, getting out of our comfort zone, um, achieving things, growing. And the fourth is personal narrative. It's who we are at the end of the day and how happy we are with who we are. So in surroundings where people cannot address these sources mm. of being, they don't have purpose, they don't feel that they belong, they don't feel well, well with their personal narrative, the way they present, or they may not be challenged. In these contexts, they are at risk to be pushed in the world of the game. And then the game comes in, 
and with what we call online flow offers them that we will talk later on about i think uh, offers them purpose and challenge it's the level of one's engagement with what they do in the game uh, belonging is covered by what we call telepresence and especially a component of social telepresence which is the sense of being in the virtual world with others and living my fantasy or playing the game with others being there and the final thing the personal narrative is fulfilled at rest by the user avatar bond by the way the user might create a character in the world of the game especially what we call role playing games yeah. where one is represented by a figure which is called the avatar and the figure develops in a way which is quite parallel to the way we develop in real life so early stages early levels they get equipment the same way that we attend education and we get degrees and then they form relationships they form alliances they have enemies later on um so within this storytelling of the game one develops a storytelling of who they are mm. So I guess with this we cover both these sources in in a broad way yes. in a context where one cannot find meaning and in a game where they can find meaning where they can so it's that push pull isn't it and it's yeah. it can be found quite easily within the game setting yeah and I would like to just add that that slide I think for clinicians is the most important slide of this whole talk because mm. if you are actually doing clinical work if you, if you can focus in on these four elements um you're going to get you know i think your chances of success are pretty high yeah to really understand what's driving people mm -hmm. um because that's going to be the solution to actually um finding meaning outside of the game mm -hmm. yeah thanks thanks hillary so you've spoken a little bit about telepresence fast can you tell us more okay um so presence is is a is a state in one's mind in the gamer's mind it's the sense of being there in the game world and mixing this mixing real with unreal feeling that i'm more there than i'm here so when one uses technology they do that to experience the world of the game when they forget the mediating role of technology they end up feeling telepresence so it's like um looking into a landscape through a window frame the window frame is the technology and and forgetting the frame you feel as if you are there uh telepresence yeah, says, yeah. telepresence is um, is very well studied so we know um game related mechanics we know demographics which are more prone to presence but it's not the time to talk extensively about that now and we have a lot of australian data regarding presence and what's happening there but just keep that in mind yeah and so it's very immersive would... isn't it so, yeah yeah go hillary I would just like to very quickly add that for, for the audience that this a whole experience of presence is is becoming intensified as we develop augmented reality and virtual reality and body suits to go along with and and all of that and so and that is technology which is rapidly developing and therefore the problem of internet addiction in gaming addiction is going to become i think greater mm. because of the development of the technology yeah so. yes it's exciting and scary at the same time mm. so vas you're also telling us about flow what's online flow um it it ties a lot with presence i i will just make a comment before flow to what hillary said because it's it's amazing she hit the the nail on the head mm. um this augmentation mixing real and virtual the sense that the game and the real world communicate and we have monetizations of the games so you have currencies and then game currencies can be exchanged to real life currencies one can buy virtual goods um hillary uh, was talking prior about metaverse and how facebook is developing into a whole virtual platform mm. and then you have this new hybrid which is called massively multiplayer social media like the virtual reality chat the new form of metaverse and stuff where people play within a gamified world without any game purpose just being there living their lives and and the two worlds communicate this this thing um maximizes presence and engagement in the context going to flow uh online flow is it it, it describes the level that one is engaged by 
what they do in the game. And for one to be engaged, they need to be challenged. Mm. So with yellow, we have the levels of skills of the gamer. And with green, we have the level of challenges introduced by the game. And the level of challenges is at a certain height. Mm. Um, Then one's skills need to be slightly slower for them to feel challenged. If their skills are, are, are significantly higher, they will feel boredom, they will disengage. If their skills are significantly lower, they will feel distressed and they will also disengage. Yeah. So the game needs to match the skills of the gamer and the game challenges. But because, because the more one is playing in a game, the more the game skills develop, the game needs to introduce higher challenges mm. at the level that matches the level of development of the skills of the gamer. And this is what we call level up. And that presents to be something, you know, not organized, but it is very, very well organized and very well calculated to the extent that in certain games, we know uh, that if a gamer says I'm level 60, they have spent three working months playing a game. So the moment you, you, you assess them and they mention their level and the game they play, if you go online, you can see the average time they have spent to reach that level, yeah. to understand their investment. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a very clever, clever system, isn't it? Um, so you've also talked to us about the avatar bond uh, as a way to uh, form that narrative um, and that sense of meaning. What, what is that all about? I'm, I'm sure that Hillary will have a lot to, to, to add here, but... Um, and I'm also sure that some of your 200 participants must be gamers. We must be having at least 10% of gamers That's here, right. gamers in the audience who know what an avatar is. Um, so um, the important thing is that research has progressed in terms of what ties the, the gamer and the avatar. And we now know that we have four main channels that connect the user offline and the game and the, the avatar in the way in the game world. The first is identification. I am who the avatar is. Immersion. The avatar's needs are my needs and our experience as priority to my real life needs. So the avatar needs to participate in a game contest. And I'm and this pri- gets prioritized to my need to sleep or eat or see my wife, my partner, whatever. Then we have relief of repressed desires. The avatar can do in the game things that I wouldn't do in my real life. So it might be more promiscuous if we have a life simulation game, or it might be more violent and goes on. And idealization, the avatar expresses my ideal self mm-hmm. to the extent that the French therapist that both myself and Hillary like listening to and, and attend his um, his work, Isidon has suggested that the av- one avatar is the royal way to the unconscious. We need to ask them about who they are in the game. Who they are in the game reflects a lot about how they would get out of the game, as Hillary suggested earlier. Yeah, right. And, and that's something, really interesting. Well, well, something I would add here is that through all of this process, um, they truly come to identify as gamers. They don't just identify as with their avatar, which also they're doing, but they have developed, they've invested so much time in their game, in their avatar being successful within a gaming community, often within a, a what they experience as a close knit community, that they really develop a an identity. I am a gamer mm-hmm. and, um, and I'm a gamer more than I am anything else. I am a gamer. And, and, and that is part of what is becomes a stumbling block in the course of treatment because uh, they've invested so much. They really don't want to give up that identity. Yeah. And then you've got people who believe that they can make a career out of it. Yeah. Uh, and, and how many of those actually eventuate and how many Very sort of few. die trying, you know, that, that's the tricky thing, isn't it? Um, just just um, touching again on those repressed desires, you know, Vass talked about um, people can act out, you know, violent acts um, and so on. Um, Hilary, I'm interested to know from you, uh, lots of people are worried that, that particularly children um, you know, engaging in these sorts of behaviours uh, might translate to, to, to things in the real world. What's your view on that? My view is that I, I think that the more we do something, the more our brains are wired to do it. 
and and I think the evidence is actually very strong that even if um, somebody who plays a lot of uh, video games, violent video games, doesn't behave in a violent manner out in the world, they often think violent thoughts, right. and they have increased uh, aggressive feelings and decreased empathy. Right. So I, I think it is problematical for children to be playing violent games. It's an overwhelming majority who thinks that um, the frequency of internet gaming disorder is going to increase in the future. Uh, and I know that we don't have a crystal ball, but what do you think, Hillary and Bass, about that? Well, I for sure think it is going to increase. As I mentioned earlier, I think the technology is going way faster than our research <laughs> and that we are going to, we are being swept along in by the companies that develop these technologies and are making money from these technologies. And they are really determining the course um, of where we're all being swept um, unless we're very, very aware of what's going on. And so, yes, I think definitely with the advances that are occurring, it's going to be a large increase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, How about you, Vass? Yeah, what do you think, Vass? I absolutely agree. And what I would say that one of these major advancements has to do with the use of machine learning and algorithms in the games, which is something that only recently we are we realized in the ITD research field. So what they're doing is um, for the company, for the game publisher to make the game more engaging for the user, the behavior of the user is observed. There are data points in terms of how one engages with the game and what makes them more engaged. And these data game, they, these data points inform algorithms, machine learning processes, um, which customize the interface of the game to the specific gamer. So, so that the gamer becomes more, um, more engaged. So algorithms in a way function as exacerbators of presence, flow, and the user avatar bond. Because observing the gamer, you know the recipe, you know how to cook the ingredients together. Right. Or then, I mean, a different interface would engage Hillary and me more in the same game. And games have the capacity to diversify yeah. in, 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 and to adjust to the needs of the gamers. So I would suggest that, you know, in terms of policies, companies need to reveal the fact that they are using algorithms in the games. Yeah, because to me that actually sounds quite unethical, isn't it? Really, the games are sort of hacking our brains, and uh, and they're on steroids. Yeah. And then, and then there's another thing. I mean, there are so many interesting questions in the chat. We don't have time. But one of the one of the participants suggests asks what's the similarity between gaming and gambling. And actually, what's happening is because it's meaningful for people to win in the game, we have the emergence of what we call pay to win mechanics, the loot boxes. Yeah. So it's a boxes which contain a secret present in the game that you need to buy with real money that you can convert into virtual money. And, um, and it's like gambling in the world of the game. And these loot boxes in other countries, Belgium and the Netherlands, 2018 Netherlands, uh, Belgium, 2020 um, Netherlands, were banned. So you are playing the game, and to win the game, there is something like a box who present, that presents in, ahead of you. You need to pay money to get the content, the equipment, which is contained in the box, but you don't know what the equipment is. It could be something useless. Sounds like gambling you find, to me. You find it yourself... Like a slot machine. Yeah, yeah so they, they are intersecting. And the, the, the problem is not the, the slot machine. It's, it's, it's why is it meaning, meaningful for someone to win in the game? Because it's not just a game. It gives them meaning. That's exactly the, the issue there. Yeah. And, and there should be policies. Yes, yeah. And, and then if you have loot boxes um, cooked together with algorithms, how many times I will be tempted to spend money to get that extra equipment mm. and someone observes me and knows and can predict how to engage me, you can understand how the recipe becomes very, very powerful. It sounds very irresistible, doesn't it? All right. So um, tell us, um, what percentage of gamers have... Yeah. Have uh, who, who ends up getting internet gaming addiction? So overall, we know. I mean, recent meta analysis suggests that four percent, approximately four percent of gamers across different national samples, assessed with the same measures, um, comparable measures, are presents with internet gaming disorder. When it comes to lifespan, 
We have adolescents emerged adulthood. Um, during adolescence, part gain participation increases between 12 to 16 for the normative population, and then decreases after the age of 16. At least this is what past data used to show. But I tend to believe that, if, that even data uh, three or four years ago is obsolete given the progress in the field. I, I don't think we understand very well. We can catch up with the industry. But what we do know is that Internet gaming disorder establishes, emerges during adolescence and emergent adulthood, which is 18 to 29. Um, for the majority of those who are going to suffer, we have more males than females. And we also um, have uh, cultural differences with people coming from more collectivistic countries like Korea or China, um, this kind of cultural background. Uh, being likely to be addicted more, and some suggest, some studies suggest that this occurs because of the need, the need of belonging. So the moment they attach into an in-game group, they commit to that group because they have this cultural predisposition to value the commitment. Uh, and we could go on about things. Uh, we also have differences in terms of game zeners. Some game zeners tend to be more addictive than others, like MMORPGs, those which are played by multiple players where one develops a character and the virtual world persists, independent of whether the gamer is online or offline. Um, but in terms of the diagnostic criteria, this, this does not play a role. In terms of the diagnostic criteria, any game, yeah. it, you know, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just MMORPGs. That's right. So when somebody with internet gaming disorder does come to us, um, what, are the, what are the helpful questions to ask? Hilary, first, um, how do you go about this? Okay. Well, what I think is, of course, you want to get down to the nitty gritty of, of their play. How often do they play? When do they play? Where do they play? Um, and all of that and time and content of the gaming and those questions that Vas has already uh, shown us, uh, all of that you want to be asking about. But additionally, I think it's very, very important to really take a very holistic approach and understand that gaming is having an effect um, on, on their them physically and socially. So you want to be asking questions about their social life, their family life, their social interactions. You want to be asking questions about their physical health, how much they're sleeping and this kind of thing. And, um, and understand that gaming, it may be where they put the majority of their time, but they are also probably going to be engaged in many other things online, mm. uh, social media, pornography, um, and so forth, shopping. And so it's, it's just important to have a very holistic, broad um, look at, at what they're doing and in their lives and how it's affecting them. Yeah, that's right. And you've covered a lot of this already, but really understanding what some of those physical and neurovegetative signs of uh, internet gaming disorder that they might be um, um, exhibiting. Uh, what are the sorts of common physical problems that you tend to see, Hilary? The chronic sleep deprivation, malnourishment, um, and either underweight or overweight. And, and really, it, it can be quite extraordinary and, and extreme. Um, the, the degree to which some of our gamers come in underweight. Uh, what I think a way to think about it is that the mesmerizing effect of the screen and the game is so strong that it overrides the body's natural needs. So the need for sleep, the need to eat, the need to move and, and social needs, the need to be interacting socially um, face to face with other people. All of these needs, which are deep and profound to us as human beings get overridden by the effect of the, the games or whatever we're engaged with. So mm -hmm. leading to the underweight or overweight, low vitamin D, they're poorly conditioned and hygiene problems, you know, dental Gosh. problems because they haven't been um, brushing yeah, their teeth. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And why is it important to talk to them about their romantic or sexual life? Well, <laughs> I think it's extremely important because most of the people that I've worked with over these many years, um, 
are males, and most of them have been involved with pornography since a very early age. And the yeah. pornography has led them off the track, the sort of normal developmental track, you know, through adolescence. Um, we're usually start learning the skills to be able to the normal track is we learn the skills through adolescence to be able to, you know, we learn to flirt and we learn how to engage with the people we're involved with and start to date and eventually bring sexuality into that. Yeah. But the gamers that we work with, they've never dated. Mm -hmm. They have just had a heavy dose of pornography throughout their lives, even if they're in their mid to late 20s, they've not dated. So we call this having an intimacy disorder where they don't know how to initiate, build, or maintain intimate, healthy relationships. Yeah, right. It's very scary, isn't it? Um, when you think about that, I, I suspect that many of them also have um, pretty un unhealthy views about women and things like yes. that. Vass, tell us about how you go about learning, understanding more about uh, that game persona. So I think... I think we have covered a lot of it before, and I think a lot of the participants understand what we are trying to say. Uh, but especially when it comes to, to children where parents are you know, concerned and they are thinking of introducing controls, controls by themselves do not work. We know that if someone is addicted to something, they will find a way to do it. In, in, in China and South Korea, they introduced um, shutdown laws for internet games in South Korea since 2011. And, and game addicts were um, stealing registration numbers of adults to, to be able to, um, to have access to games because there was this Cinderella law banning games between midnight and 6 a.m., uh, which was recently, recently uh, replaced by what they called the, the, the choice permit law, where they, they need to submit an application with the agreement, the consent of their parents about the times that they will be playing games. Anyway, but this doesn't work. What, what works is to understand what they are doing in the game, mm. who they are, how they are seen by others, um, how would they describe themselves. Use this third uh, empty chair question. If your co-gamers were here, how would they describe you? Yeah. Uh, what's your name in the game? If this avatar was here, how would they describe, they describe their, real, their, their virtual life? Knowing these things, you understand how to map their way out of the game. Mm. What keeps them in the game um, uh, betrays the way to take them out. If I want to achieve, then I need to find something to achieve. If it's belonging, it's there. It depends on the, the, the area of meaning that the game covers. Yes. Yeah. And, and something in relation to the intimacy disorder that Hillary mentioned before, I, she reminded me of a study, 14 to 16, longitudinal study published in PLOS One 20, uh, 2018, which indicated that higher internet users and not, and not gaming users excessively um, increased avoidant romantic attachment. And that was a shocking finding mm. because we, we can see, we now know what's happening, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Hilary, can you tell us about Restart's clinical approach to... I'd be happy to, but I do want to just mention something um, related to what we were just discussing, which is that it is so important when you're assessing someone who's come in, what is happening within the family itself? What are the family dynamics? How are the parents using their screens? You know, what are the rules? What are the relationship of the, of the gamer to the other family members and... Uh, and, and all of that is extremely important uh, to approach when you're actually doing the clinical work. If you uh, work with a client in isolation without working with the family, um, you often not gonna are not going anywhere. to be successful. Yeah, so I just right. wanted to say that. And that's part of our clinical approach is to include the family in the work we do with the adults as well as with the adolescents. Um, we, we, have our clients away from screens for three months. Uh, so they really go through a physiological, a lot of physiological change. Mm -hmm. um, they usually are out of denial by the end of three months and ready to really engage in the work. They, they create a, during that time period, a life balance plan, which 
Um, and that life balance plan is really the plan of how it's going to be the blueprint for how they're going to go back into the world where screens are all around them. How are they going to manage all of that? What will their screen use look like? Identify the top lines, which are the things that are going to keep them healthy and on a recovery track, the middle lines, which are the danger zones and the bottom lines, which are the things that they're just not going, they're agreeing they're not going to engage with anymore. Um, and so we slowly reintroduce the screens through our transition program, and we have them engaged, both they and their parents, if we can talk the parents into it, engaged in some sort of a community recovery support. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a que it's a question that's come up in the question in the chat box. But you know, in Australia, we don't have access to that sort of um, uh, uh, inpatient um, unit. Um, so f for people who can't fully disengage, what are the other options for, to have to, to simulate that sort of three-month unplugging? So well, I do think that if, if we're talking about children and, and you as a clinician are working with the parents, mm -hmm. um, I highly recommend the approach that is written up in, in the book, Reset Your Child's Brain by Victoria Dunkley. And she recommends a one month period of abstinence for a child from screens. Sure. Yep. And during that time, engaging in a good, healthy conversation with the child and all of the family members about what the rules are going to be right. when, right. once they do re-engage. So doing that, I think, is a wonderful way to approach it. The trouble is, I think many families many parents don't have the skills to do that or the situation has gotten just too out, so of, out of control and it's behaviors. too violent or, right. or whatever. And so seek, you know, seek, seek help. professional help. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, Hillary shared some um, great points with us uh, that, you know, clients often present with other, with other problems, whether they've got anxiety, depression or physical problems. And so we've really got to ask a little bit more. And I certainly know that the head screen, there's now a fifth S or something uh, that relates to screen, um, that we've got to take a really holistic approach. As you said, we've got to think about the family um, and the family system. Uh, use, you know, think about plugging them into a 12-step meeting or other sort of support group. Um, and, you know, it's really tough because uh, screens are ubiquitous now and their influence is assumed to be benign. I'm conscious that we've run over time. We're going to go for a few more minutes. If you'd like to stay with us, um, that's great. But if you, if you can't, I understand also. Um, I just wanted to share with you um, some specific online tools that you might find helpful for your clients. Uh, first up, we have um, Online Gamers Anonymous, which is a 12-step self-help group online um, that's very similar to Alcoholics Anonymous where members can share their stories uh, and keep one another accountable as they seek to uh, recover from internet gaming disorder. There's also uh, a program called Game Quitters uh, which has a program for gamers called Respawn and one for family members called Reclaim uh, that also has community forums, videos and a directory for therapists who specialise in the area. Uh, Game Aware uh, is an Australian-based program that provides mentoring and group programs for children and young adults with internet gaming disorder and a specialised group for gamers with an ASD diagnosis. Smart Recovery Australia is an online resource that uh, is aligned with the University of Wollongong, uh, which is an app that helps people manage and overcome addictive behaviours, including uh, internet gaming disorder. Uh, there's quite a lot of information on the eSafety Commissioner website um, and for parents and for children around um, setting limits and, and allow, you know, make, making sure that your children can be using um, online resources safely because there's a lot of harms out there. When we think about gamers, I mean, these are uh, people who are pretty comfortable using technology and, as we've said, uh, you know, they're very likely to have another mental health disorder as well. And so I'd like to um, encourage you to think about using resources such as This Way Up, which is a fantastic online manualized CBT resource uh, for many, many conditions 
uh, both depression and anxiety. Uh, we also have um, Smiling Mind. I'm sure most of you are familiar uh, with Smiling Mind, but what you may not know is that um, they have a specific digital detox program within their app that supports individuals to take a break from technology and reconnect with your surroundings. For general um, information and a directory um, around e-mental health resources, we have Head to Health. Uh, and uh, WellMob is, is the uh, Australian uh, portal for e-mental health resources for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. If you're interested in learning more about e-mental health, please come and join us on the Community of Practice, where we have more than 7,000 uh, uh, community-based mental health professionals where we talk about all things mental health and support one another. I'd like to particularly thank um, Hilary uh, for joining us all the way from the US and sharing um, all of your experience with us tonight. And Vass, of course, for putting together um, this presentation and uh, bringing to us what the research has to say about all of this as well. If you'd like, um, they've kindly shared their email address with us um, on this slide. Um, and you can also contact us at the Black Dog Institute if you have any further questions. Um, so thank you so much for joining us um, and uh, hope to see you next time. Good night, everyone.